Welcome back to our study of the Purpose Driven Life. In our last session, we began this series by asking the question, what on earth am I here for? And we looked at some of the benefits of knowing God's five purposes for creating you and for living a purpose driven life. We talked about how knowing your purpose focuses your life and it simplifies your life and it gives your life more significance and more motivation. You know, life's a lot more fulfilling when you know what you were put here for. Now, in this session, we're going to look at the first of God's five purposes for creating you. And here it is. You were planned for God's pleasure. This is the first purpose of your life. You were planned for God's pleasure. You see, you were made by God and you were made for God. And until you understand that, life's never going to make sense. It all starts with God. Not you, not your dreams or plans, but with God. And you were put on this planet, first of all, so that God could love you, and so he could enjoy you, and so you could learn to love and enjoy God back. Now, as amazing as it seems, you were created by God for a relationship with him. Now, not a religion, but a relationship. God knows everything about you, and he loves you in spite of that, and he wants you to get to know him and love him back. Now, the Bible uses a particular word for this first purpose, but the word has been so misused and abused that it's lost its original and true meaning. The word is worship. Now, when I say the word worship, what ideas come to your mind? For a lot of people, worship is a synonym for music. They say, you know, in our church service, we had the worship, then we had the sermon. Or depending on your religious background, you may think of worship as being prayers or ceremonies or candles or rituals. But worship is far more than just what happens on Sunday morning. The Bible defines worship very, very differently. Worship is what happens any time you live to bring pleasure to God. One day a man asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? And Jesus responded by saying, the greatest commandment is this. Love God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second greatest commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus said that learning to love God with your entire being is the first and primary purpose of life. And this is what real worship is all about. Worship is about loving God. It's about living a life that brings pleasure to God. All the other things, singing and music and praying and all those other things, they're tools of worship. But real worship is what happens in your heart. It's expressing your love to God and living your life to please him. So in a nutshell, worship is far more than going to church. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of loving God. So how do we do that? How do we live a lifestyle of worship? How do we live a life that is pleasing to God? If you have a Bible with you in this session, I want you to open it to the book of Romans chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay because all the verses will be here with us. Let me give you a little bit of background. Paul devotes the first 11 chapters of this book called Romans to explaining all the wonderful things God has done for us by creating us, by sending Jesus to die for us, and by preparing an eternal home for us in heaven. And he explains our salvation and our forgiveness of all of our past and our security in Christ. And all of this is a result of one thing. God's mercy or God's grace. Then as he begins chapter 12 of this great book, he says in verse one, I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now, these are very important verses because they explain exactly what it means to live a life of worshiping God, which is God's first purpose for creating you. So here are the steps for living a life of worship. Number one, the first step is what I call the principle of of dedication. You must dedicate yourself to God. Verse one says this, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Romans 12, one shows us the three characteristics of the kind of life that brings pleasure to God. In other words, that makes God smile. 
First, worship is voluntary. It is an, a voluntary dedication of your life to God. The Bible says this, offer your bodies. Now, offer means to vol- voluntarily surrender, to voluntarily give. Now, of course, God has a right to demand that you live for him. Since you wouldn't even be alive, you wouldn't even exist if he hadn't decided to create you. But God wants you to love him voluntarily, not out of obligation, but out of love. So he's given you the choice. You don't have to love God. You can worship God or you can reject him. The the Williams translation of this verse says this, make a decisive dedication of your body. And in Greek, which the Bible was originally written in, in the New Testament, the word used here uh, is the picture of making a reservation at a table in a restaurant. Isn't that interesting? The table has been set aside for your benefit because you made a reservation. And nobody else can use that table because your name is on the reservation card. Now, when you offer yourself to God, you're putting a reservation card on your life. And you're saying, God, my life, my time, my money, myself, all of it, it's reserved for you and for your benefit. But you do this voluntarily. You know, sometimes unbelievers look at believers or followers of Jesus and they think that we worship God and live for God out of fear or that we worship God out of duty or that we live for God out of pressure. But that's not the case at all. No, real worship is voluntarily and we live for God not out of obligation, but out of gratitude. Now, second, this verse teaches us that practical worship is a dedication of our lives in a practical way to God. Notice the verse says, offer your bodies. Now, why doesn't God say offer your soul or offer your spirit? Why does he say offer your body? Because when you give your body, it means you're really getting practical. And worship is not just voluntary, it's practical. Have you ever heard anybody say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't make it to the meeting tonight, but I'll be with you in spirit. Do you know what that means? (laughs) It means nothing absolutely nothing because your spirit isn't there as long as you're alive your spirit is wherever your body is it can't be somewhere you're not and if your body isn't there neither are you now do you see how practically and real uh worship is the bible says in first corinthians 6 19 and 20 haven't you yet learned that your body is the home of the holy spirit that god gave you and that he lives within you your own body does not belong to you For God has bought you with a great price. So use every part of your body to give glory back to God because he owns it. You see, whenever you use your body for God's purposes, you are worshiping no matter where you are. You may not be in a church, but you're worshiping. You don't have to be in a service. If you're using your body for God's glory at that moment, you're worshiping him. So worship is voluntary and worship is practical. And the third, worship is complete. It's a complete dedication of your life to God. The Bible says this, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And sacrifice means complete dedication to God. But there's a problem. There's a problem with a living sacrifice, and that is a living sacrifice can crawl off the altar. (laughs) And a lot of us do that. We sing onwards Christian soldiers on Sunday and go AWOL on Monday. We say, I surrender all on Sunday, and on Monday we're doing our own thing again. You see, worship is a moment-by-moment dedication. It's lifelong, and it's moment-by-moment. Now notice, the Bible says that when I offer my life to God voluntarily and practically and completely, and when I dedicate myself to fulfilling his purposes that he made me for, the result is this. My life is holy and pleasing to God. And it is also a spiritual act of worship. So get this. The first part of living a life of worship is the principle of dedication. You offer yourselves totally to God, voluntarily, practically, and completely. Now the second step of living a life of worship is what I call the principle of insulation. To bring God pleasure, you insulate your life from the negative and the sinful influences of the world. Now, I'm not talking about isolation, but insulation. And there's a big difference between these two. Let me explain. The next part of Romans 12, 2 says this. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Now, what does the Bible mean by this, the pattern of this world? Well, let me explain what he's talking about. 
He's not talking about the people of the world. The Bible says God loves the people in this world. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us. Here God's talking about the world's value system. He's saying, if you want to live a life that brings me pleasure, a life of true worship, you can't get caught up in the self-centered, selfish, materialistic, me-first mentality that you find in the world's pattern of values. The Phillips translation of this verse reads, don't let the world squeeze you in its mold, kind of like a toothpaste uh, being squeezed. Have you ever felt pressured by the world to conform? You can sum it up in a single phrase. Well, everybody's doing it. But just because everybody's doing something doesn't make it right. So how can you live in the world without being infected by the world? Well, the answer is neither isolation nor imitation. The answer is insulation. Now, let me explain. Uh, Most religious people go to one of two extremes when it comes to relating to the world around them. Uh, Some of them are isolationists, and they say, I don't want to have anything to do with the world. I'm not going to go to movies. I'm not going to go to watch TV. I'm not going to read newspapers. I won't shop in certain stores. I'll stay as far away from the people of this world as possible. And they create their own little version of culture. Maybe they live up in a monastery or up on a mountaintop. There's a problem with isolation. Jesus is against it. Jesus told us to share the good news with the people of the world. And he modeled this himself by hanging out with all kinds of people. In fact, he did this so much that the, quote, religious people called Jesus the friend of sinners. I love that phrase. He was called the friend of sinners. I want to be like Jesus. And if you want to be like Jesus, you need to be the friends of sinners. That means everybody. And by the way, let me remind you, you're a sinner too. So am I. Nobody's perfect. Nobody bats a thousand. We've all made mistakes. I don't measure up to my own standard, much less God's. So the answer is not isolation. On the other hand, uh, some Christians and followers of Christ and even other religious people, they try to go to the other extreme and they become just like the world. And they imitate everything they see in the world's culture. And whatever the world does, they do it too. They want to fit in. Well, as a result, they lose their distinctiveness. Now, since the Bible clearly tells us that the solution is neither imitation, be just like the world, nor isolation, stay completely away from the world, what are we supposed to do in living a life pleasing to God when the culture is often the opposite of what God wants us to do? The answer is insulation and infiltration. (laughs) Let me give you an example. I love to eat seafood. When I order a piece of swordfish or sea bass in a restaurant, before I can eat it, the first thing I have to do is I have to pour some salt on it to make it tasty. Now think about that. That swordfish or that tuna, that sea bass, has spent its entire life living in salt water. And yet before I eat it, I have to put salt on it. Now, if God can keep a fish in salt water its entire life without the salt permeating its body, then God can certainly keep you in a uh, irreligious or non-spiritual world without you getting infected. That's insulation. Notice the phrase, it says, don't conform. The Bible says don't conform. Most people make their decisions based on what's acceptable to other people. They wonder, what will other people think? And they build their lives around public opinion or what's popular, whether or not whether or not it conforms to God's will. But if you're serious about the first purpose of life, living a life of pleasure to God, a life of worship, you can't be worrying about what other people think. Now let's review. First, if you want to live a life of worship, a life that brings joy to smile to God, you must offer your life to God voluntarily, practically and completely. You say, God, I want to do your plan, not mine. Second, you must learn how to live in the world without letting the world and the opinions of other people and the expectations of others control you. Now, there's one other verse, one other key in this verse. The third part of living a life of worship is the principle of transformation. Transformation means focusing your mind on God. Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do I renew my mind? By focusing and setting it on God. And by thinking about God, not just on Sunday, but throughout my day, minute by minute, focusing on Him. And when we do this, we're no longer self-focused, we're God-focused. 
The Bible says this in Psalm 16, verse 8 and 9. I always keep the Lord in front of me. When he's by my side, I cannot be moved. That is why my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body rests securely. You see, joy, peace, these things come from not focusing on your problems, but focusing on God, and that's called worship. Now, Paul closes this very important passage from the Bible on worship by giving us the three reasons why we should live for God's pleasure. Notice the last phrase. It says this, You will then be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice that, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you want to know God's purposes, God's will for your life? Then you need to be a worshiper. You need to surrender because God will only reveal his will to people who are completely surrendered to him. Don't say, God, first show me your purposes for my life and then I'll say yes. Show me your plan, then I'll decide if I want to do it. No, you just say yes, then he'll show you his will. Because ultimately, living a life of worship is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for you. Now, how God works out the details of his will in your life is something he's going to reveal to you over time, a little bit at a time. But I can tell you right now, without even knowing you, that there are three things that are certain about God's purposes for your life. First, living a life of worship is God's good will for you. It's a good plan. The Bible says we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. It's not all good, but he works it all for good in your life. And he has a good plan for you. Second, living a life of worship is God's pleasing will, his pleasing plan for your life. Now, he'll direct your steps along the path that he's designed for you. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And when you offer your body to God and you let him transform your mind, he will show you the plans he has for you. And they're good plans. And step by step and moment by moment, he's going to direct you in the way that you should go. And that way is pleasing, not just to him, but to you. Now, when you live according to God's plan, it's not always going to be bright. Let me be clear about this. It's not always going to be cheerful. It's not always going to be fun. But it will be deeply satisfying, and it will be fulfilling because you know you're doing what God created you to do. Now, third, living a life of worship is God's perfect will for you. Notice he says it's his perfect plan. Perfect doesn't mean sinless. It means complete or whole or nothing missing. Literally, it means that God's plan for your life is tailor-made. God's plan for your life is different than God's plan for my life. It fits perfectly like a suit that's been custom-made for you because it's what he created you to do. And when you live a life of worship, it's fully surrendered to God's purposes. He is going to show you his perfect, complete, satisfying will for your life. And God's will for your life as, as the scripture says, is good and pleasing and perfect. Not just for him, but for you. And when you live according to his will and his design, you will say, this is what life is all about. And you're going to come to the point in your life, you'll go, this is it. This is, I know why I exist now. It, it fits me. It feels good. It's, I know why I was created. To know and to love God and to fulfill his purposes for me. This is what I was meant to be. Now, as we close this session on the very first purpose of your life, I'd like to ask you a couple of personal questions. The first one is this. Have you completely dedicated your life to Christ? Have you done that? Or this. Have you offered your body to Christ, to God, and said, I offer you my body? Have you said, God, the first goal of my life is to get to know you better and to learn to love you and to fulfill your purposes that you put me on earth for. Now, let me just be blunt. Until you come to that point in your life, you're not really living. You're just existing. Life of getting up in the morning and going to work and coming home and watching TV and going to bed and doing that over and over seven days a week, that's not living, that's just existing. God has much more for your life. And it begins with this relationship. 
Last week we closed our session by me asking you to be open to God, to be open up your mind to Jesus Christ and the fact that he has a purpose for your life. Now this week, in a separate video, I'm going to explain, and it's a very short video, how to become a follower of Jesus Christ, regardless of your religious background, whether you're Jewish or Muslim or Catholic or Buddhist or Baptist, whatever, or no religious background. And at the end of this session, I've added that additional short video that will help you take your next spiritual step by beginning a personal friendship with God's Son, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage all of you, after this discussion time, to come back and review that very brief video together. Now as we close, let's bow our heads together, and I want you to follow me silently in this prayer as I pray. Dear God, I want to live the rest of my life created to be what you made me to be. And I want to live a life of real worship, getting to know you and love you on a personal basis. Thank you that your plan, your purpose for my life is good and pleasing and perfect. So today, right now, I, I dedicate or I rededicate myself to you voluntarily and practically and completely. Jesus Christ, I give as much of myself as I understand to as much of you as I understand at this point in my life. I don't want to live for the expectations of other people. I don't want to be pressured to conform to the world's value system. But I want to focus on you, and I ask you to transform me as I focus on you, not my problems. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining me in this session. God bless you, and have a great discussion time.